Thank you for joining our webinar on Justice Adapting Atlantic Canada Law Societies. If you experience technical difficulty at any point, please exit the meeting and re-enter using the link provided. Please note that this is being recorded and LexisNexis will distribute the link in a timely manner. On behalf of LexisNexis and the panel, we, are, we hope you are staying safe during these unsettling times and thank you for doing your best to flatten the curve. As COVID-19 events continue to unfold, LexisNexis Canada is working to support the legal community. The Practice Advisor Coronavirus Resource page provides a document kit that can be downloaded for free. Please visit lexisnexis.ca slash COVID-19 for more information. Today's webinar will now begin. I would like to introduce the moderator, Sarah Eisen, Manager of Financial Practice Areas and Content Lawyer for Corporate and Private M&A Modules of LexisNexis Canada. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Nana, for that introduction. And welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us. I am very pleased to introduce our distinguished panelists. Robert McGregor is president of the Law Society of Prince Edward Island and counsel at McGinnis Cooper. His practice focuses on corporate and business law, representing clients in a wide variety of matters. Robert is also a sessional lecturer at the University of Prince Edward Island teaching business law. Tilly Play is executive director of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Previously, she was the executive director of legal services for the Nova Scotia Department of Justice. Tilly's extensive volunteer involvement with the society goes back more than a decade, having served on several committees. Ian Petit is president of the Law Society of Newfoundland and Labrador and partner at O'Day Earl. Ian has worked exclusively with O'Day Earl for 20 years, where he has a litigation, labor, and employment practice. Ian maintains an active volunteer role in the community and is an active member of the Rotary Club of Avalon Northeast. Mark Richard is Executive Director of the Law Society of New Brunswick. Mark was admitted to the Law Society of New Brunswick in 1990 and practiced law in Bathurst until 1996. He has been the Executive Director of the Law Society of New Brunswick since 2003 and received his Queen's Council designation in 2011. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to get started right now because we have quite a few questions for you today. And Tilly, if it's okay, I'm going to throw the first one in your direction. What is your general experience since the start of the COVID-19 crisis for your law society? Thank you, Sarah. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, there was quite um, a uh, variety of responses to the experience. So first of all, um, there was an initial shock and, an, and not really expecting that it would evolve so quickly. And that initial shock, I think, froze us for a couple of hours. Um, but once we got past that initial shock, we were surprised how quickly we could move to remote working, how quickly we could change our communications um, and still continue business as usual. It was really taking our business continuity plan and amping it up. And so I suppose that's one of the main lessons coming out of this is to have a good, solid business continuity plan in these times. Um, it was always a very, it was a moving target because um, as the uh, COVID-19 situation unfolded, there was evolving information every day, every hour. So we were learning at the same time as we were trying to respond. Um, and we found that we had to have a handle on information that was beyond the normal information we would provide, legal information, information relating to stakeholders. Um, we had to know about um, health information and how to provide that information to our members. We had to know about uh, business information, financial resources, how could they access that? So the scope of what we had to learn and absorb ourselves and then share with the membership was broader. Um, our communication changed uh, as a result of the situation. It changed sometimes on an hourly basis. Um, we wanted to be in 
constant contact with our members as well as our staff. And so we use various methods to do that. One week, for example, it would be an email from me. Another week, it might be an email from our president of the society, a different nature to the communication. Um, we felt we had to be responsive. We, had to, we felt we had to be proactive, not reactive. So we tried to identify all the issues that we thought our members would be facing and develop the partnerships with our stakeholders like the Department of Justice, the courts, CBA, to uh, try to anticipate matters and resolve them as quickly as possible. The other thing that is different about this situation is that we're not just dealing with members who maybe are experiencing business issues or a loss of clients or uh, lots of legal questions about how you get around the fact of the social distancing. We were also dealing with emotions. People who were anxious, who were stressed, who were experiencing financial ins insecurity. And so our resources in that sense really had to expand to inclu include um, lawyers assistance programs, uh, what information is out there uh, for self-help and mental health and physical health. Um, we found we had to be agile and respond as needed. But the most important thing was to be at the end of an email or at the end of a phone line to be able to respond to our members' concerns. Thank you, Tilly. Ian, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure. Um, I think our experience was somewhat similar to Tilly's, not, su uh, not surprisingly. I mean, we, we were certainly in uncharted waters, although we had had a quite a large uh, snowstorm in January, Snowmageddon, which shut our province down for a week. So the idea of working remotely then was a bit of a trial run. Um, our law society is fairly well positioned for the staff to work remotely um, before this happened. Uh, we had the technology available for everyone to be set up at home quite quickly, and we did have a contingency plan developed in place, which was, of course, put into full swing in mid-March. Um, administratively, in terms of the operations of the law society, our committees, uh, administrative tribunals have quickly shifted to doing hearings by teleconference and video conference. So uh, to the extent we can have business as usual, we're doing that. Um, uh, one of the great experiences I will say is that uh, we have had great success consulting with uh, justice and public safety in the courts. Uh, any issues that we've had, we've been able to openly consult with them and, and it's, it was important uh, for that to happen, of course, so that we could assure the public and our members that you know, questions that were coming into us were being acted on. Um, the other general experience I think I can comment on uh, for us, I think it's a common, common occurrence for everyone. Uh, the courts here have, uh, as they, you know, in other jurisdictions have been relatively slow to respond to the pandemic. Uh, it's uh, it is a reality of, you know, uh, deciding on what your operations are going to be uh, are, uh, when they are completely governed, essentially governed by, you know, directors from the chief medical officer. That's the, that's the governing body that's directing any developments for us here anyway. Uh, ours have recently started to take steps to expand the scope of matters uh, and the things that they were able to address. Uh, that's, a, you know, been a great positive for us so far, but it is an evolving an evolving process. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Robert, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your experience. Yeah, Prince Edward Island has been similar to, to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'm sure New Brunswick. Um, as far as the Law Society Council is concerned, we've since, we typically have uh, council meetings once a month scheduled and we've moved those to video conferencing meetings. So there, there's all kinds of uh, shifts of uh, communications to various online or telephonic means. Um, and that's something that we, we had some anxiety over, I suppose, at, at the outset. But it, you know, in hindsight, it, it was not a big switch to, to do something simple like that in order to, to move it online. Uh, we have a relatively small uh, staff in our law society, um, and those folks are um, primarily working from home. Although even when they when they are in the office, it's uh, it is relatively easy to maintain social distancing. Um, the biggest 
general uh, issue for our law society and PEI has been the heightened uh, amount of communication. Um, you know, whereas I think Tilly was mentioning, you know, we might be some correspondence to members uh, once or twice a week. Um, since the, especially at the outset of the, uh, the pandemic, these communications were uh, daily, sometimes multiple times per day, almost to the point where we're starting to wonder if we're bombarding people with too much information. But, um, you know, those were the, those were the, the biggest uh, changes that we saw was trying to ensure that we were communicating with our members, ensuring that uh, much like Nova Scotia, that they were aware of who to contact as far as mental health issues are concerned or uh, lawyers assistance programs. Um, and a big part of our communication was, you know, the same as Newfoundland was with our uh, Department of Justice in trying to come up with some, some amendments to our Registry Act in order to uh, deal with virtually commissioning documents. So that, that was, uh, that communication stream with the province was uh, significant. There was a lot of people involved and, and continue to be involved in that process. So uh, I, I, you know, overall, our general experience in PEI has been this heightened amount of communication to, to members and various other stakeholders in, the, uh, in our legal services industry. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Mark, can you share your experiences? So it's, it's similar to the other three jurisdictions. Initially, the, it was kind of the initial shock. I just came back from vacation and all of a sudden, everything was shutting down almost. Uh, so, uh, so it was kind of anxiety initially, uh, but we knew at our office, we were always set up. And it, in fact, uh, uh, we had just probably two months before that, installed a new server. So we didn't have any problem with technology. Everybody could work from home. And we shut our office even before our province uh, declared a state of emergency. So we're already ahead of time. Uh, and as we work, and a bit like uh, Rob said uh, earlier, our, our concern at one point is, I, I thought we were probably giving too much information to our members initially. So we, we kind of, even though we could uh, send some messages out, uh, to help them out, we kind of waited a day or two between messages because it was the first few weeks was overwhelming, I think, for the members, and we had to slow it down a bit uh, just because it was just too much. And at the same time, we we're about to start an election process. Uh, as this, the pandemic was declared, we just put it on hold for a month because we just we had to let the law firms and the, and the solo practitioners to set themselves up in case they were not ready to start working remotely, et cetera, and give them time uh, until, and since then, what we realized from the membership is that, uh, that I think they appreciate a lot of the information we provided to them. Uh, and even within the bar, everybody's been really cordial. It, 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 the message was, uh, we're all in it together. Uh, so we got to work with each other to make things work, uh, not to make things difficult for everyone. So, uh, so and, and again, our, we had an open line communication with our chief justice. You could call them up, send them an email, and you're on the phone within 15 minutes, as long as they were not on the phone already. And we had the same type of collaboration also with our minister of justice and the deputy minister of justice. So that's, uh, but basically we had the same type of experience as the other three law societies. Thank you, Mark. Ian, I'm going to direct this next question to you. It's getting a little more specific now. Did you receive a lot of requests for support from your members? And if so, what kind of support are the lawyers looking for? Well, we, we, we really started this uh, pandemic by providing very detailed information to the members at the beginning of the crisis. So, uh, and we engaged in government very quickly and the courts as well as the others, other jurisdictions have done as well. So, uh, you know, taking that proactive approach, we were able to get ahead of most of the issues uh, we, well, we think we did anyway. And uh, so we, like the others, had a lot of information uh, out before the members came looking for it. Uh, but you know, we have had a number of inquiries for support or intervention. 
uh, from the members. Primarily, um, they've been looking for clarity on the issues related to uh, the extent to which the public could access court services, given the level of service that was being provided. We had a, um, the, the general division in particular and uh, the family division uh, continued to allow uh, matters that were uh, deemed urgent. So we had a lot of discussion and inquiries around what, what constituted an urgent matter. Uh, we uh, also had inquiries and look, requests for support with respect to the witnessing of wills, deeds, and other registrable documents, much as uh, Rob was speaking about a minute ago, and swearing of affidavits. Thankfully, that process came to a head yesterday or the day before with a royal assent of legislation that now enables us, after two months, to engage in the virtual witnessing of documents, which was a spectacular development and initiative that uh, we've been working very closely with uh, the DMs and ADMs and Justice and Public Safety on. Uh, we've also uh, fielded suggestions with respect to amendments to legislation that were uh, brought in with the Temporary Variation of Statutory Deadlines Act. We had a piece of legislation enacted quite early that uh, extended limitation periods and, and other, you know, in various pieces of legislation out by uh, a number of months, uh, which took some pressure off uh, our members who were anticipating potential insurance claims and whatnot uh, from ex you know, expiring limitation periods. So that's the general kind of support that we've been receiving uh, or people have been looking for so far. Thank you, Ann. Robert, what has been your experience? There have been a significant number of requests from members in Prince Edward Island for, for support, but it's, it's primarily been around the idea of uh, document signing. So you know, deeds and mortgages, uh, how are we going to get documents signed by clients? How are these things going to be witnessed? Um, a lot of that information um, uh, and suggestions went out from our, our law society to members relatively early on. It was after having the benefit, frankly, of, of reviewing FAQs from other jurisdictions, including Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Alberta, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Um, so we had uh, the benefit of uh, a template for FAQs that we revised for Prince Edward Island, distributed it to members. Um, but in terms of what they were looking for, that was a big part of what um, our members were seeking was some direction on whether uh, virtual commissioning of, of registry documents was permitted and uh, how they would physically go about doing that. Um, so we had issued a, a number of suggestions to people and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador obviously has been uh, much quicker off the mark on, on this in this respect, but our uh, Registry Act amendments were, the draft was just circulated to uh, our Law Society executive this week. And my understanding is that the legislature is meeting on, uh, is sitting on May the 22nd. So we're hopeful that that uh, bill will make it to the floor on that date. And, and it's, it, you know, it's certainly, much the same as what Ian was suggesting was that it, you know it's it's going to be a a welcome change to our registry act. Um, the 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 idea of virtual commissioning is particularly during these uh, this pandemic is going to be of uh, of great significance and and um, make some of our practices a lot more efficient. I think. Thank you. Mark, what's your experience been? Uh, it's uh, basically, initially, uh, when the state of emergency was declared in New Brunswick, some of the first questions we got from, from law firm is, are we allowed to practice law? Uh, because it, it could, it, it, the first state of emergency or mandatory order that came out from the province, it wasn't clear because it didn't refer to essential services, who was included or not. Uh, uh, we just happened that when it, it, it was released, or the Minister of Justice, who's a, also one of our council members, uh, indicated you just got to use your common sense and 
as long as you use uh, social distancing, you're okay. And eventually they, they provide some guidelines uh, for everyone so that, that basically it was specific for lawyers and law firms and accounts that they can, re they can remain open as long as you, you, you keep your distance, et cetera. So, uh, but afterwards, it's really, uh, again, same as the other promises, it really is the virtual witnessing of documents. And, and in New Brunswick, probably within seven days to 10 days after the state of emergency, we were able to, uh, to advise our members that we could do uh, the uh, uh, witnessing of documents, especially in real estate, affidavit, et cetera, uh, without having any amendments to our registry system, just because of the fact that so New Brunswick ha has a different approach than Newfoundland and also uh, PEI, uh, similar to, to, to Nova Scotia, because of the fact that our systems are, are different. How we operate, how we do our the registry of certain documents, et cetera, it's, they're different in each province. That's why the, the response was different uh, or quicker and some need legislative uh, changes while others didn't have to like ours. Uh, so, and, and the same things, the limitations of action that was suspension of it, that was one of the questions that were asked often, which it's now been in effect in New Brunswick. We're still having, uh, we're still working on swearing uh, or witnessing of wills, I should say. Uh, but you also get all sorts of questions. For example, if, if you allow for the swearing of documents, you don't realize, but most of your clients probably don't have a Bible at home. Uh, so you have to give further directions that uh, basically most of your documents probably should be done a firm rather than swearing because not necessarily a whole lot of clients do have a Bible at home to swear on a document. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's been our experience. Uh, and, and the question has died down a bit uh, just because we provide them with enough information. But there's still once in a while when there's a new directive that comes out from the government, uh, we might have other uh, questions that are raised as a result of amendment legislation, for example. Thank you, Mark. Tilly? Thank you, Sarah. Um, one of the biggest issues that we found um, is with respect to wills and estates. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the people who have uh, been victims of this pandemic are in long-term residential facilities and um, in times like this, people's minds turn, uh, turn to estate planning and what's going to happen in the future. Um, and so the commissioning of wills, the virtual uh, commissioning of wills is a big issue. And um, we uh, worked with both government and the courts to, to develop a process that could be acceptable in the interim. Um, so what we did is we received a lot of uh, inquiries like the ones my colleagues have uh, shared with you. And we did uh, started uh, triaging uh, an FAQ site, a frequently asked questions site, because we felt if, um, if Mark was asking the question, then probably Ian had the same question as well. And what's the best way to make sure that everybody gets that information without bombarding them with emails all the time? Um, so that's what we did. I, I'll give you an example, but there were, there were a couple of really practical problems. One is the border problem, because when New Brunswick and Nova Scotia closed the border uh, between them, there are a lot of people in northern Nova Scotia who commute to New Brunswick uh, to meet with clients, to, to work there. And their question was, well, how can I do that now? Um, and it was it's not a legal question. It was a very practical solution about to, who to call to explain the situation to and who to get a permission from which authority to cross the border to meet with the client, for example. Another example we had was um, a lawyer who had it all arranged uh, to meet a client um, at their long-term residential facility outside the window so he could be socially distanced with a witness also socially distanced so he could take um, the, uh, the signature and um, the facility wouldn't let him on the property. So he couldn't, he was trying to be as creative as possible, but, uh, but then they closed it down. So then we had to work with him um, to work with the facility to see how we could um, have it happen. So some of the questions are not all legal questions. Some of them are just practical common sense questions. Oh, thank you, Tilly. That's very interesting. Um, for the next question, I'm going to ask uh, Robert to take the lead. Did you have to make some changes related to bar association fees or CPD to support the lawyers in their practice? Um, I mean, in terms of CPD, um, there were changes, but they, there weren't changes that the Law Society made. There were changes that were effectively forced upon us. 
Uh, there were a lot of uh, CPD sessions that we had uh, scheduled and just there was it seemed almost daily uh, at the outset we were we were finding another one was canceled um, we're now looking at uh, trying to make efforts to uh, bring some of these CPD uh, sessions uh, online um, because you know in PEI like many jurisdictions we have required number of hours of CPD credits and you know we recognize that by requiring these hours of our members we we have an obligation to ensure that some of these programming uh, opportunities are available to them so my expectation is that you know take for example our our annual meeting which we typically hold in june every year uh, it always has a cpd component and this year that in-person meeting has been canceled uh, we'll be meeting with council on monday in order to consider whether we uh, bring that meeting online virtually or whether we extend it into the fall. Um, so we haven't necessarily made any changes to our, our programming or the required hours. Uh, it's more or less looking at opportunities to bring some of these uh, uh, sessions online for, for our members. As far as fees are concerned, uh, coincidentally, we had our budget committee meeting yesterday and I'm probably going to uh, give some of our PEI members some advance notice of what's happening as far as our budget's concerned. Um, our fees uh, aren't being reduced, but they are remaining uh, status quo. So our, our fees are not changing from last year. Uh, we are waiving a, in, in principle, now we developed this uh, reimbursement fund that we uh, increase and, and maintain every year. It's designed to assist people who are unable to access uh, insurance in the event of uh, an issue on a, with a client with a, a lawyer's file. But in any case, it's a relatively small amount that members contribute to that reimbursement fund each year. In any event, we're waiving that uh, that contribution. Um, and in terms of the actual payment of our fees in Prince Edward Island, uh, ordinarily we have. Uh, two installments that are due each year and we're increasing that. So it's the same number, uh, the same amount of fees. It's just going to be uh, opportunities to make those in three installments rather than two installments. So it hopefully will provide a little bit of um, cash flow uh, positivity for uh, the members of PEI, especially the uh, smaller and uh, solo practitioners. Thank you, Robert. Mark, can you weigh in? Uh, yeah, sure. With respect to CPD, uh, for our New Brunswick members, this will be new for them today, I guess. Uh, we haven't, because we wanted to limit the number of emails that went out, uh, so we'll probably get another email today or tomorrow. But with respect to MCP, the CPD hours, again, here in New Brunswick, we accredited the courses. In, in addition, members have to do 12 hours per year. We just decided last week that that will be suspended for the year, for the rest of the year. Uh, in addition, whomever had already uh, had a number of hours uh, that they had completed earlier on the year, they, they would have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, carry them over for next year. Uh, some of the, re there's a number of factors we had to consider. Uh, uh, the, the biggest employers, I guess, uh, that rationale the 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 cost uh, to to for their members to attend CPDs etc. You had the national conference from the federation on the criminal law and family law board had been canceled. Uh, the uh, the crown prosecutor's annual conference, which usually do, they would have CPD also in there, was canceled. So because of a number of those, and also in New Brunswick, uh, there has to be a. a, 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 a conferences provided in both official languages. In quantity and quality, uh, so uh, at the end of the day, we uh, we just decided that through this year we we be suspended for this year, and uh, we'll see what happened next year. So a lot of things were on the table, maybe reduce the hours, but the final decision was really to su suspend it for the rest of the year. 
uh, mind you, there still might be some conferences being offered uh, virtually, et cetera, because uh, we don't offer those conferences. Uh, we have uh, two other groups in New Brunswick who mainly provide those conferences. With respect to fees, uh, we looked at that also. Uh, typically, our fees went out last week. Uh, uh, no increase in fees. We This is the third year in a row that we didn't have to increase in any of the bar dues. Uh, and, and what we have in New Brunswick is there's a grace period of two months to pay the fees. So technically, if everybody went until the end of uh, uh, June to pay their fees, we would basically operate without any funds for two months. So we were not prepared to go to three months for the time being, it's two months, and, but we'll be flexible. Uh, it will be more on a case by case basis. Uh, uh, in our insurance program, uh, again, they'll get their fees uh, and members have the opportunity at, at, on the insurance side to pay their fees either on a quarterly, quarterly basis or even on a monthly basis. Uh, unfortunately, we can't offer that on the for the law society fees because the structure is different because it also includes the fees of the Kenyan Bar Association, which is mandatory here in New Brunswick. Thank you. Uh, Tilly, can you share your thoughts? Thank you, Sarah. Yes, so um, I'll start on the fees issue because most people have a great deal of interest in that. So um, like PEI, we just held our fees um, the same, so there's no increase or decrease. Um, in Nova Scotia, you have uh, two choices. You can pay your fees upfront in one uh, payment, or you can uh, do a monthly payment plan. And so um, we continue to offer that. And what we've also done in the course of the past couple of months is we've offered um, uh, members who are on the monthly payment to defer one month's payment so that um, if they were experiencing difficulty, they could pay it later. Um, so that's it on the fees. On the CPD side, our year goes from July to June. And so most of our members have already got their CPD hours. But we have also said that if you do not um, have your CPD hours, please contact us and we'll see what we can do, um, whether we uh, waive it or whether we can find um, some other ways for them to um, get the hours. Um, we're, we're not going to penalize members for that. Thank you, Tilly. Ian? Well, on the, uh, the society and insurance fees, we've had very few requests for any adjustments in fee payments. Um, our member fees are due at the end of January, so the bulk of the fees have been paid for the year, or some are still continuing to be paid on an installment basis. Um, the first installment of the risk-based portion of the insurance premium, uh, which is calculated on a per transaction basis, that was due at the end of the first quarter uh, but we've deferred that now until the end of the second quarter. And uh, if there are any requests for deferral, uh, I mean, the Law Society will deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, with respect to uh, CLE or CPD, uh, some years back, we installed the technology to deliver all of the, um, all of the sessions that are held in our building uh, by Zoom uh, across the province, given the, the, the geography of the province. Uh, so uh, the only change uh, with that is it, it, now everyone has to attend uh, online. And so we've made a complete shift to online delivery. Um, we did offer a webinar on the 2nd of April regarding business continuity in the wake of the, the pandemic. And uh, that, that session explored the options available to legal practitioners as they were attempting to adapt to uh, remote work. Um, We've dropped the fees for the CLEs offered since the pandemic in light of you know, any financial difficulties that many solo practitioners, firms, and organizations are facing. Thank you. I'll move on to the next question. And uh, Mark, this one is directed for you to start. Did you have to put in place any special initiatives during the COVID-19 crisis for your members considering the challenges they are facing in their practice? For example, are you considering creating a program to provide financial help to lawyers for whom the situation has a greater impact? Well, what we did uh, initially, it, it has to do with our members, but also with the students at law, uh, which we consider to be members. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, we had a, a, a number of probably around 60 students who were about to be admitted this June. Uh, so what we did is uh, we allowed for them to work remotely, because technically our rules indicate that they have to be located in the office to, to do their articles. But uh, we allow them to finish their articles remotely. 
Uh, and in addition, in the event that uh, some of the students uh, would have been laid off because of the pandemic, uh, basically we would uh, reduce their, abridge their time to complete their articles. Uh, so for some students, it might represent say, an abridgement of five weeks, or while others could be up to a maximum of nine or 10 weeks uh, to allow for them uh, to, uh, to be admitted to a bar in June. Uh, so, uh, and fortunately, uh, it only happened to two st students who had to be laid off because of the pandemic. Uh, most of them were able to continue on to do their articles with the firm that they're currently with. Uh, we've also made some changes for the students, the new students who were starting the Arbara Mission program as of June. Uh, typically, they would start their articles in, in April, not April, but May or June. Uh, but so, uh, uh, we had a large percentage of, uh, of the students who were not able to uh, start at that time. We had that indication from some, a number of the firms. Uh, and then basically we, we allow for, we still require them to be part of our admission program, which is 12 months. But as far as the article component, we reduced it to nine months. Uh, we still encourage the law firms to continue hiring their students right now to start uh, the, the articles, but if, if a student couldn't start before the month of September, that would be acceptable. Uh, because our, our admission program, our students start still start in, 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 in June. They start off with a, uh, what we call a, uh, it's a new program that we have, it's called a sustainable practice course. It's an online course. Uh, they have to do an exam also, uh, which is online, uh, which we are still gonna be offering online. Uh, that's in July, so they're still part of the program. Uh, so uh, other initiatives that we put in place, for example, is uh, the, uh, the uh, trust account reports. Uh, in New Brunswick, lawyers have to retain an accounting firm, independent accounting firm, to do the, uh, their audits of their trust account. The, the reports were due by the end of June. Well, another, uh, and on both sides, the accounts or the lawyers did not want the accounts come in into their office and vice versa. The, the, uh, the accounts didn't want to go into the lawyer's office at this time. Uh, so the whole process has been delayed for another two months. So the law firms only have to file their, their reports before the end of, uh, uh, I believe, June 30, uh, August 31st, I believe. So, and again, election, we delayed the, the election not to bother our members at that time. And the election process only started last week, basically. So that's what we put in place. Uh, we didn't have any initiatives to compensate our members, et cetera. Uh, we just don't have that kind of finance to have those types of programs in place. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Tilly, can you share your thoughts? Yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, so with, uh, just pick up on, on Mark's last point, which is about uh, financial assistance for lawyers. Like New Brunswick, we don't have the financial ability to do that. Uh, I know our board um, uh, is interested in seeing if something is possible. Uh, the only jurisdiction I know that does that or does have a, a fund in place is Quebec. They have a separate fund. However, Quebec um, is, operates differently from, from other law societies across the country, and, and they may have a different setup that allows for that. But um, I'm not aware of any other law society um, that is doing that right now. Um, with respect to the various things that we've done as a result of COVID-19, I'll repeat what Mark says, we automatically extended the filing of uh, the trust account reports prepared by accountants. We reduced the articling period, which would normally be one year to anywhere between nine months and 12 months, because some people were either getting let go early or will be starting next year late. So we are recognizing that. Um, we have, and then I, it, mentioned earlier about the deferral of fees and we are offering that now as well with new fees that are due that we um, will uh, talk to people individually on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, if there are issues. Um, and then uh, lastly, in Nova Scotia, we are part of uh, the Prairie Provinces Bard Mission Program, um, which is mostly uh, delivered online. Um, and we have amended our regulations to allow students to complete that entire online course uh, prior to starting articles. So typically in Nova Scotia, they start articles in June. 
and they would do the first module of that course. Well, now they can start that course in June and finish it entirely in 12 weeks time, and then they can begin articles in September. And the idea was to try to remove another barrier from somebody um, being able to meet all the qualifications for admission to the bar. Thank you, Julie. Um, Ian? Well, we haven't had to change much in order to continue uh, with the work of the law study, other than allowing some leeway uh, with respect to the client identification and verification rules. We've uh, allowed for virtual verification. Um, our disciplinary processes have continued in accordance with the act, you know, on a virtual basis. That's both the CAC and adjudication tribunal proceedings. Um, the major initiatives, again, have been the legislative changes that, that have been enacted over the last couple of months. Um, and again, the continuing to clarify things with the courts. With respect to articling, um, those requirements for admission have been modified. We've, you know, we've turned to accepting unofficial transcripts, provided there's a do documentation from the university confirming accuracy. Uh, affidavits are going to be sworn at a later date. Uh, passport style uh, photographs can be provided at a later date. Uh, we've uh, it allowed for the remote supervision of article and clerks uh, and the education committee is actively welcoming proposals for any alternate articling arrangements in avoid you know in an effort to avoid uh, terminations or layoffs um, we don't have any plans to alter the delivery of the bar admission course it's scheduled to start on October 5th uh, of course it, it happens in the same uh, room as our CLEs happen so we were able to deliver the bar admission course online from that from that facility if need be, uh, and given you know the technological capabilities that we have, uh, we don't have any plans to abridge the article period, uh, unlike some jurisdictions. Uh, and thankfully, we were able to hold our first virtual call to the bar in Canada. We understand on the 17th of April, which was a testament to the cooperation uh, that we've received with the court staff and the chief justice and able to make that happen. We had students getting enrolled, sitting in their homes in Toronto, getting called to the bar in Newfoundland on that date. So that was a great, uh, a, a great development. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Robert? Uh, in Prince Edward Island, we, we haven't put in place any special initiatives, uh, certainly financially, other than some some minor adjustments surrounding fees that we just spoke about. The, the bar admission course in Prince Edward Island uh, typically occurs, you know, October and November. Um, I'm hoping that we're not going to be at a point trying to decide whether that, whether that course goes online. Um, but that all depends on when uh, these restrictions really, uh, really are lifted. In terms of the article, those people who are articling right now, whether they are working remotely, that's not going to negatively impact their uh, their 12 month uh, articling period. Uh, for those folks who are just starting articles, and, and we recognize that you know, where they would normally start in May or June. Uh, some or perhaps all of them may not be starting till September. Uh, that is one of the uh, issues that we're looking at as a law society council is, uh, is whether we are going to abridge that process. Um, much like Newfoundland and Labrador are at this point, it's not our intention to do that, but we're going to have that discussion on Monday with our council. Um, and then make a decision. Um, the, the real benefit uh, we have in PEI is that we're, we're a bit unique in that bar admission courses or bar admissions are individual calls in this province. Um, so you would have one person being called as a new lawyer in the courtroom uh, surrounded by you know 50 or 80 family and friends and uh, members of the court. Um, and there's no set dates for those calls. So it's, uh, you know, if, if someone starts their articling period in September, uh, it, it, and by the time June rolls around, it doesn't mean that they're missing out on their call date. They can set that call date as soon as they complete that 12 month process. So, um, you know, at least in terms of the articling, the 12 month articling period, 
um, our uniqueness gives us a little bit more flexibility in uh, ensuring that members get called to the bar as soon as they complete their, uh, their requirements. Thank you, Robert. Tilly, I'm going to start with you on the next question. Did you have to learn or use new software technology or use new communication methods such as social media, websites, or podcasts in order to connect with your members? Thank you, Sarah. Um, we didn't actually have to use any new methods because we use all of those already. But what we found is that we were using them all more to, um, to supplement what would sometimes have been in-person contact with members. Um, and so um, committee meetings and board meetings um, are happening virtually via Zoom. Um, and um, if there are meetings where we have to have them with members, we, have, we do it by Zoom as well. Um, going back to the questions, one of, one of the big questions that we had from members uh, when they initially started to practicing in this virtual environment is what software is best? Um, what's got the best security features? And while we couldn't um, endorse one particular software or the other, we did sort of put out the questions that they needed to consider the privacy considerations. Um, and in the first uh, couple of weeks of this pandemic, I'm sure other people experienced it as well. Things were crashing all over the place because there wasn't the infrastructure to deal with this sudden virtual surge in virtual communications. But that has really stabilized over the past um, six or seven weeks. So we, what we have done, and I mentioned this in my, the answer to the first question, is really change up the communications, choose different ways to communicate so that it's not always the same person giving the message and it's not always received in the same method. So sometimes we might use a survey, sometimes we might use a, a email communication, sometimes it just might be something out going through our social media. Thank you, Tilly. Uh, Ian, what has your experience been? Well, we really didn't have to learn or use anything new, much the same as Tilly. We had the technology in place uh, for Zoom, of course, Zoom meetings, virtual meetings, uh, we have stepped up a hundredfold the, the, the volume of communication going out by email and Twitter and on our website. Um, uh, we're in regular communication with our membership via those broadcasts and newsletters on a weekly basis. Uh, so, so nothing really new, but the volume has increased considerably. Uh, always looking for uh, input from the membership uh, as we always have, but uh, particularly now, given the, the situation we're in, uh, looking for input from them on a, any problems that they may be having, reaching out to them in every platform that we have available to us to keep that communication open. Thank you, Ian. Robert? Uh, personally, uh, no. Um, I work with uh, Midianus Cooper, and I'm basically daily surprised at the the, the kind of technology that we use here. I mean, as far as Law Society communications are concerned, um, the primary means of communicating with our members has been through email, but um, Susan Robinson, who is our secretary treasurer, is always very willing to um, field calls from members. And in Prince Edward Island, members are quite willing and welcome to contact the uh, Susan Robinson by phone. It's it's a very uh, collegial bar. It's a small bar. Uh, you know, every every member of our bar knows our executive director. Um, so in terms of you know new software technology, the, there is nothing new that we're using. Um, the the what I am seeing with uh, with new tech new technology use is with clients. Um, you know, I had a, uh, a call, a ver uh, it was a video call with my uh, tax practice group this morning. And, and one of the issues that was discussed was uh, particularly with elderly clients uh, who are doing estate planning. Um, some of them, they either may not have a computer or a smartphone, so they're, they're not accessing Skype or Zoom or Microsoft Partners. Um, and in addition, some of those uh, particularly elderly clients are, are somewhat hesitant or cautious to use those kinds of technologies anyway. Uh, so to answer your question, there, there isn't any new software technology that we as a law society or as lawyers are, are learning or using. It is, it, it's sometimes on the client side where 
we're finding that there can be some certain level of disconnect. Thank you, Robert. Mark, what has your experience been? Well, uh, nothing has changed for us. Uh, our main communication uh, since the pandemic has been by email uh, and everything we would send by email, we would post it on frequently asked question on our website or any communication we sent out uh, was also posted on our website. We don't have a Twitter account just because of the fact that it, it, it's a lot of work for us because everything that goes out is in both official languages. So it's as if you, we maintain two websites, uh, two streams of email. Well, it's the same email, but it, there's a lot more work involved. Uh, so uh, is that, it's not as if I can type something and everything goes out all in one shot. It's there's, there's a process for us. But uh, other than that, it's it's the same communication means just uh, because 98% of our members uh, uh, provide us with their email. So that's been the main uh, communication tool that we've been using. Thank you. I think that um, we're out of time for regular questions because I'd like to take some of the questions that came in uh, previously. And I don't know if there are any questions that came in during the session. I will check on that as well uh, if we have time. But the first question that I would like to ask, and it's, it's a follow-up to what you were discussing before about articling. And Ian, maybe you can address this. Do you think there will be a lack of locations, firms, and organizations that will offer articling? Well, I, I think that's, you know, a, quite a, a real possibility. Um, the, you know, the sense that we're getting from the membership, and it's, you know, obvious given the circumstances that we find ourselves in, is that, uh, there are financial negative financial consequences to the shutdown of the economy, which has uh, happened in large part, and uh, its impact on law firms and their capacity to uh, hire articling students um, uh, is is almost a given. I suspect. Um, I understand that some for some firms have deferred the commencement of articling uh, into the fall. Uh, that that's understandable given the circumstances that everyone finds themselves in. Um, so, uh, in you know, in short, yes, I think there may well be an impact on the availability of articling positions. Robert, what's your experience, uh, or what are you likely to see? It's it's very similar in Prince Edward Island. Uh, we are aware that uh, some of the the larger law firms in our jurisdiction will be delaying the commencement of articles into September, uh, starting in September. Um, and that I think is still assuming that these restrictions will be lifted by then. Um, we're all hopeful that they will. The, I mean, in terms of the positions available, a lot of those positions have already been um, put in place. Those offers have gone out and been accepted by article clerks. Um, what I'm kind of expecting is particularly for uh, small or small firms or solo practitioners in this province, those offices may take a second look at this and decide to, you know, either defer uh, an articling position until next year or, or later in the fall. Uh, so you know, it's definitely going to have some impact on the number of positions that are available in this province. Um, you know, the, the other, I guess, benefit of being a small jurisdiction is that we're not anticipating uh, more than uh, 12 or 13 article clerks uh, starting this year. Um, and for the most part, it's usually uh, we're usually able to ensure that they have a position somewhere. Um, sometimes it takes some, uh, it takes some imagination by us as members in order to ensure that they get uh, full exposure to all areas of law or uh, are able to uh, spend 12 months working somewhere. But, um, you know, we, I guess the simple answer to the question is that, yes, I am expecting some, uh, limitation, I suppose, on the on the, the number of uh, uh, positions that are going to be available, say, come September. Mark, what do you think is likely to happen in your province? I think it's the same as all the provinces. Uh, I mean, typically, this time of the year, we would still have some students looking. Uh, 
Uh, and I suspect this year uh, they're still going to be looking. Uh, there's always a small percentage that uh, at this time didn't uh, find a job yet. And, and it'll be delayed. Uh, and hopefully that they'll be able to find something before September. Uh, and again, it's nobody knows. Uh, it's really hard to predict. Uh, yeah, we did uh, reduce the articlings for a period for from 12 to nine months to accommodate some of the firms to really, once it's start, I can't say business as usual because it's, you know, it won't be business as usual, but they have to set up themselves. Do you have to be uh, able to operate their own firm before they can bring in some students to uh, teach them uh, or, or part of their articles? So uh, I anticipate that there will be some impact, but uh, we don't know. I mean, uh, I didn't expect that two weeks ago that we wouldn't see any COVID-19 cases in New Brunswick. We were good for 16 days. We got two the last two days. So we don't know. Uh, you hope for the best. Tilly? Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so far in Nova Scotia, we're actually not seeing such a big impact. Our articling applications have just come in. We typically have anywhere around 72 to 77 students, and we've got 67 in already. So um, it's seeming like we're going to be close to what we expect. However, um, it would be naive to think that there isn't some kind of impact on potential articling positions. And what I'm interested in looking at is to whether this has a subsequent year impact as well, because uh, the COVID-19 situation is not just going to be for this year. Okay. I am going to try to squeeze in two more questions before we're done. So, uh, Mark, I'm going to start uh, with this one with you. How do you see the reopening of the courts with all the cases that will need to be heard? Is there a lot of communication among the law society, the courts, the government to find solutions? Well, so far, I, I, I've looked at last month, I think we sent out 10 communications from the courts. Uh, they've been proactive. Uh, and I'll give you an example at the Court of Appeal in New Brunswick. Uh, you can have a hearing by video conference. I think the resistance uh, at the Court of Appeal level is, has been from the lawyers. They've been offered to have their, hear, their case heard by video conference and, and the lawyers, some of the lawyers have declined to, oh no, I'll wait to later when I can have a face-to-face -face hearing. So uh, we can't put all the blame on the courts because really some of the members are really, they prefer having a face-to-face -face hearing. So, uh, so that's been the experience at the Court of Appeal. Uh, at the Court of Queen's Bench in New Brunswick, uh, it's set to open January, uh, June 1st. Even now they start relaxing some of the rules, et cetera. And, uh, and the judges at, at that level have been instructed by the Chief Justice to uh, not to take any vacation uh, for, the, for the summer, to be ready to uh, be able to hear most of the cases that have been adjourned so far or matters have been set aside for whatever reason. And, and, and in fact, the, the courts have been very open. They, they've created a committee to come up with new technology to use for, at this time and also in the future so that because in New Brunswick you have lots of storms, etc., and but the courts are always open. Why can't you do a a a a, 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 a hearing by a video conference, especially if it's not a trial to hear witnesses, etc.? Uh, even about the technology, New Brunswick has been far behind the te technology, uh, and hopefully that uh, uh, why is it necessary to to file an actual signed affidavit? Uh, that has a real signature on it rather than just a PDF, for example. Right now in New Brunswick, well, before this uh, pandemic, that was not permitted. They have allowed for it now, and uh, uh, so hopefully we'll keep on going so that's more streamlined to improve the process of um, going forward. Uh, Ian, can you share your thoughts with us? Sure. Well, it's clear that the court openings are going to be governed by the directors that come out of the office of the chief medical officer. She's the, uh, we, have a, we have a provincial health emergency here as opposed to a state of emergency. So the, the CMO's office is, is, is really directing how things are going to evolve uh, with the courts. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of the numbers of staff that are going to be available to be inside the facilities, that's going to be a, a, a simple pr product of what the CMO's office permits. Uh, and what our, you know, we are what the buildings permit um, as well, given the uh, the age of some of them. Um, 
like in New Brunswick, our court of appeal is, is as of the beginning of May, is business as usual, conducting, uh, sitting virtually and conducting virtual hearings. Uh, I suspect as, uh, as the CMO's directives allow for larger groups, we, we will see uh, the court expand services. Um, and really, frankly, all along, uh, the, the communications that I've been having with the Chief Justice and others has been uh, working so that if it can be done, it will be done, and and that's I, you know th I suspect that's how things are going to continue. Um, there will be uh, you know a triage of the things that have been uh, delayed uh, in the interim uh, period, and uh, the extent to which we can get back to uh, trials, and and you know it's very difficult to imagine cross-examining witnesses and you know putting documents to witnesses while COVID is an is an active uh, an active agent in the community, so it's going to take some time, but it, it will happen. It will evolve. Um, in terms of communications, constant communications. I, I've received a call two days ago from the Chief Justice's assistant, looking to set something up for a, a chat. I've got a, a Skype meeting tomorrow with a, one of the assistant deputy ministers and the senior court uh, uh, administrators tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. So there is no shortage of communications. Uh, everyone is really working to do as much as can be done. Thank you, Ian. Robert? Yeah, and Prince Edward Island is, is quite similar. Um, there's a tremendous amount of communication coming out from the courts as to uh, their processes, uh, you know, appearances today, and what, uh, what they're doing in order to ensure that some of these matters are, are moving along. Um, there was communication come out from our Court of Appeal this week uh, concerning the idea of um, um, video conferencing um, some of the sessions. The, the you know, the things like uh, filing of documents, we look at uh, probate documents, we have an option to uh, e-file our probate documents at this point. Um, some of these things were in the works for, for a period of time before all of this started. Um, you know, our courts were moving, you know, each day, each month, more towards an electronic uh, system or more of an electronic system. Um, and, and, I, and I don't mean to make light of this pandemic situation by saying this because there's people that are really sick and some people who have died. Uh, but if there was any um, positivity to, to, to come from this pandemic, it's that, you know, those steps that the courts have been taking to become more electronic uh, have just been, uh, you know, moved into warp speed. You know, what, what we expected was going to take uh, two years for the courts to get to, uh, they managed to get to that point within you know, say a month at this point. Um, so, um, you know, when these restrictions are lifted, um, I'm fully expecting there is going to be, uh, there's no question, there's going to be a backlog of matters that the court is going to have to deal with. Um, and I don't suggest to make, uh, make any uh, commitments or decisions for Chief Justice Jenkins or Chief Justice Clements in, in my province. Or, or Chief Judge Orr, but um, what I wonder is whether there are going to be um, differing schedules uh, going forward, at least in the near term. In other words, you know, where there would be weeks set aside in the summer for judges writing decisions, you know, some of that time may be opened up for hearings. Uh, that's just uh, my thought. That's, uh, I don't get that information from, from, from anyone. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Tilly? Thanks, Sarah. Um, so the same applies in Nova Scotia as, as what everyone else has said. Um, what I, um, um, we have in Nova Scotia a, a court liaison committee that is actually set up between the Bar Society, the CBA and the courts. And we are using that vehicle for communication. Uh, I'm sure all the law societies, as you've heard here and across the country, have developed good ongoing relationships with their stakeholders, departments of justice, court registries, court services division, the judiciary, et cetera. Um, everybody has had those relationships in place for a long time. It just goes to show how at times like this, those established 
establish relationships can really help uh, things move faster. Um, certainly in Nova Scotia, the courts are doing what they can to open up uh, the courts. Um, and um, like Robert says, they've been uh, um, using, uh, exploring technology, using technology and um, other forms of dealing with court matters. Um, I'm hopeful that when, that we will have a lot of good lessons that we've learned when we finally get out of the pandemic about how to practice better as lawyers and how to operate better in institutions. Thank you, Tilly. That's a great way to end. Uh, our time is up. I want to thank all of the participants for joining us today. The link to this webinar recording will be available soon and will be sent to all the participants that have registered. A big thank you to our distinguished panelists today for their time and important guidance during this event. On behalf of LexisNexis Canada and myself, stay safe and thank you.